Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's Monitor Farm Monday webinar where we will be digging up the dirt, pun is definitely intended, on the Soil Health Scorecard. Um, the Soil Health Scorecard is a project that um, falls under our banner of Great Soils but it's funded by HDB and BBRO um, and we've got some great speakers lined up to talk about bits tonight. As always we start with a bit of housekeeping. So firstly, to remind you all, you are all on mute. We can't see or hear you, um, but hopefully you can see and hear us. If you have got questions or if you're having any technical issues, there is a handout that's available that might talk you through some um, sound and audio issues. But there's also the chat function where you can send in questions. If you've got basis and erosive points, they can go in there. And if you've got any questions, they can go in there too. We are due to finish at eight o'clock. Um, I will do my best to keep us to time. Uh, I know that evenings are pressure. Um, we have got basis and erosive points. So if you do want those, you can claim them by putting in your details into the chat function. For basis, it's your name, uh, basis number and postcode and the ROSO, we need the same. This is being recorded. So if you want to catch up with anything, if you miss anything or if you have to dash off, don't panic. Um, the recording will be available on YouTube afterwards, so um, you can catch up there. And um, well, as always, uh, do give us a follow if you're on Twitter um, and keep up with what we're up to. So the agenda for tonight, um, we've got two great speakers. Henry is our Penrith Monist Farmer and Liz, I'm sure many of you will have come across before, um, but is the head of farming systems research at NIAB and is going to be taking us through the Soil Health Scorecard. And that's all I really want to say tonight because um, let's face it, they're much more interesting than me. So we'll kick off with a bit about Penrith Monitor Farm from Henry. Yeah, good evening everyone. Um, yeah, so we are Brackenborough Home Farms. Uh, we're situated between Penrith and Carlisle. Uh, it's run by myself and James Turner. Um, we have three farms that we farm. Um, we've got a dairy farm, a sheep farm, and sort of an arable unit. Um, we've got about 250 hectares of arable cropping, um, slightly more grassland, uh, which we have 250 crossbred dairy cows, um, sort of Holstein, Danish Red, Blackby crosses. Um, we've got 850 breeding ewes, which are predominantly mules. Um, we also look after 320 odd hectares of lowland heathland, which we manage with some suckler cows and some hill pigs, as shown in the, the picture. Uh, and we have quite an extensive higher level stewardship scheme, um, which encompasses the lowland heathland as well as some of the arable land. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows a brief breakdown of last year's cropping. Um, we didn't set any real world records with yield at all. It was a pretty grim harvest. Um, the two pictures I've shown are sort of two of the more respectable crops. Um, that the rape um, was actually pretty good. We entered two hectares of that rape field into the yen. Um, I think we came ninth. We averaged five. Five, just over five and a half tons to a hectare, um, which we were pretty happy with. Um, we use the oats um, for whole crop for the dairy cows, the beans, we feed those to the dairy cows, um, as with the fodder beef. Um, so it's sort of, sort of a rotation that, that supports um, the dairy and the sheep enterprises as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this just shows a bit of our um, machinery. Uh, the top picture shows our, our two main tractors, um, along with the slurry tanker, which we have. Um, we invested in a three and a half thousand gallon slurry tanker with a trailing shoe um, to try and cart more slurry away from the dairy to, to the grassland further up the farm, uh, which we'll sort of talk more about, I think, in, in due course. Um, our crop establishment. Um, is min till where we can. Uh, we've bought a horse pronto um, drill this year with, with a split um, seed and fertilizer tank. So we inject um, phosphate fertilizers into the seed bed. 
Um, we have in front of the front door into into stubbles. We go with a, an ASL five-legged subsoiler. Um, well, soil loosener. It doesn't go in that deep, um, just to take the surface compaction out. Um, we're trying to go min till everywhere. Um, we have had to plow a little bit this year. Um, just with harvesting wheat in the middle of September to try and get a chit on those wheat volunteers to then drill winter barley the week after is just impossible. So we've had to plow for all our, our winter barley this year, unfortunately. Uh, but we are looking at how we can maybe expand the rotation a little bit to, to avoid the need to plow for winter barley. Um, so that's sort of something we're looking to develop. Um, I think that's about all I've got to say as an introduction, really. That's great, Henry. Um, just a quick question that's come in. What's your standard rotation? Um, so, so winter barley, oilseed rake, wheat, um, and then either into beans or oats, or and then then into wheat, or straight back into winter barley. So it's it's usually either a, a one in three or a one in five. It sort of depends on on the fields and. Um, and how it fits but that's sort of our rough rotation and we're potentially looking to go to a, a one in six more sort of fixed rotation um so yeah that's what we're doing brilliant thanks for that that's a really nice overview um and as part of the monist farm program this winter you've undergone the soil health review and liz has come out to look at your farm so um i'm going to hand over to liz and she's going to talk about what she found at Penrith Monas Farm. Cool. So welcome to everyone. Um, basically, what I do is, is something that actually anybody could do. There's, there's nothing very specialist about what I get up to in the implementation on the Monitor Farm. It's basically a tour with a spade. But the key aspect there is around um, thinking about where that tour should go. So usually before I go on to farm, I have a bit of a look at what soils information is available. And this is the UKSO site, um, the UK Soil Observatory site, which, which gives access to a range of soil resources, including the Landis data, but also things like the underlying um, parent materials. And it did amuse me. So Eight Bank Farm House, Farm Steading is over here and the farm, roughly speaking, operates in inside this circle here that um, when I looked this this site up before I went to visit I uh, discovered that it's got probably the least useful uh, information about its subsoils uh, possible and that's because it's an underlying um, glacial material which are inherently variable they they are um, called boulder clay for a reason they're a mixture of everything from clay to silt to sand to gravel to boulders and actually what we have here at, at Eight Bank is, is that smeared glacial material across the landscape. It is possible to zoom in a little bit and the soilscapes for England and Wales suggest that actually part of that farmed area um, is over more sandy materials with free draining acid loamy soils and that green area actually is slightly heavier. Still acid but with some bases but a mix here of loamy and clay soils and, and in fact that divide here with that green strip of those slightly heavier soils coming into the sand isn't what Henry expected us to find. So we had a, a, a bit of a look together in the farmhouse before we went out or I went out um, and identified some sites spread across the farm and our intention was to to put into place six monitor sites on light and on those medium soils with a predominant mix of the arable soils with five sites sped across the rotation and across that texture divide but at the same time we were really interested in having um, a comparison site we wanted to know actually given the amount of pasture that's on the farm would that be showing us actually the potential perhaps of these soils and Henry told me that there's pretty much a straight line and the, the, the wiggle is just my inability to draw a straight line on the computer I think pretty much a straight line down the, the middle of the farm following roughly speaking the line of the railway um, 
where it's it's light on that easterly side and, and slightly heavier on the um, west. It has to be said that Henry told me those were heavy soils. They're not. They're, they're pushing clay loam, not any heavier. So what did we do? Well, I did take Henry out to prove that actually I wasn't doing anything clever. And what we started off by doing was visiting the site closest to the farm. I'm not going to go into this in any great detail. Um, some of you will have will have looked, uh, joined us on the Northampton Monitor Farm tour when we talked about the process in a lot more detail. But we're here bringing the data together. And the idea is with the soil health scorecard that the measurements we take are accessible to anybody to do. So it is a tour with a spade. It's a matter of taking an observation of the physical structure of the soil. Um, in the same block of soil, we count the earthworms and we take a sample that's sent away for analysis. So current and, um, soil analysis tends to take a, an approach of identifying fields or zones um, and then using perhaps something a bit like a W walk or a grid sample to get a good understanding of the pH and the routine nutrients to underpin fertilizer management planning. In terms of doing a soil health scorecard, we're using this circle approach. The idea that we identify a geolocated point, we use, or I dominantly use, what three words to identify those sites. You might have noticed that from a, a slide I showed you a minute ago, so ago. Um, when I've located those points, I put my bucket down and I stay within five meters. So it's not a specific, it's not a tiny point. So what three words is perfectly accurate enough given the little bit of wobble we have on satellite data. We do that combination of infield scoring and then we collect samples and send them away for a slightly extended analysis um, path beyond our P's, K's and MG. And the idea of the scorecard is to then take that data and express it in relation to the uh, sort of traffic light system. So what I'm showing you here is the traffic light system I was using for one of the extended measures. So this is loss on ignition, organic matter measured by loss on ignition, the, the standard um, approach. Or, and if you've had organic matter measured in other ways, it's relatively easy to, to convert it back to look at it in this way. So this is taking account of soil, main soil texture type, cross compliance groups, and giving um, the target levels where soils on average are for this soil type, indicating where soils are high, and um, actually for the light soils, indicating that we find very few soils um, above 9% organic matter, for example, but also flagging where that organic matter might start to be um, red, in this context, potentially constraining to production, or amber, that just means we need to keep more of an eye on that um, organic matter level. It's, it's below what would be expected for that soil in that region. And we do the same with other indicators too. So for example, we take the, the standard RB209 reporting for pH with that optimum bound in the middle green and amber either side, for example. But I'm gonna show you more of those scorecards in a minute. So what did we find when we went on tour? And um, we're gonna have a look at these results together. So Henry's going to, um, to join us for having a look at, at what we see here. So the tour with a spade um, really shows us First of all, just putting out the soils that we saw um, as we went on tour. And here we've got those light soils, the sandy loams, all of them with their clay content between 12 and 15 percent. Um, the soil closest to the farm, which had been recently cultivated and was was the sandiest, but only just. Um, the soil just up the road. Um, um, where the soil was still in um, stubble at the point that we were taking the sample, and then soil along the road, uh, along the road and round, where the soil's in that pasture comparison. So these soils are pretty much similar to one another in terms of their basic soil texture, and actually in terms of their physical properties, really. Um, we've got probably slightly more of the slightly larger 
structural units in Site 6 and Site 2 than we have in Site 1, and that's not unexpected given the recent cultivation. Um, and actually, you'll see in a minute, also not because those soil, these soils at 2 and 6 also have slightly higher organic matter. And then the soils at the other side, onto those more medium soils, we've got more differences here. Um, the heaviest soil actually is is orange in colour, similar to those sandy soils, but is 34% um, clay. The other soils closer to the railway actually only just into clay loams at their 20% and 25% clays, but more differences here. And it's much clearer and it's the body of the soil given by the, the restructuring of the soil given by those clays that are able to hold the sand's particles together that give us this more stru clear structural units and but nonetheless really quite good structures through all these soils. I think one of the things that, that regularly strikes me when I, I put presentations together is just how valuable these photographs are as a record of what we're seeing. So now to the scorecard. So we're in a high rainfall region. I put the sites here not in the order I sampled them but grouped those light soils one, two and six and those medium soils five, three and four together. We can see the good soil structure here, the visual assessment score across these sites, um, all scoring at two with good soil structure, so green on the scorecard, which means none of you would be looking at this data at all, because all of your eyes have gone immediately to what's red. The soils here are naturally low in calcium, magnesium and sodium. Um, not on the scorecard, but I, in, I help have calcium and sodium measured as a benchmark while I'm having um, the potassium and magnesium measured. It's the same extractant, so it's relatively cheap to also have calcium and um, sodium um, measured at the same time. And that's just a useful benchmark. There's nothing in my mind that's particularly special about the balance between calcium, magnesium, sodium and potassium. But what's key is that there's enough of those nutrients available for plant growth. Calcium is particularly important to support rooting. And it's, so it's really useful to know whether soils are at an appropriate level. And on these soils, um, we would be needing to lime to maintain pH. And the lighter soils have lower buffering capacity. Higher sand content means less ability to hold on to the calcium and magnesium in the lime. And that means that they are more likely to need liming more often than the medium soils. So I'm just gonna let Henry tell me about his liming policy. Um, it's, well, it seems from those results to be, to be looking at doing okay. <laughs> it, it, it's all handwritten actually um it's all test we generally try and test um before we put winter barley in we try and test them sort of every three years um, we got everything tested before we were putting winter barley in this year fully expecting to have a bit of liming to do um, and they all came back as adequate um so yeah we tested quite a lot of grassland um this summer and did quite a bit of bit of lime on on some grassland. Um, so site six got lime in end of June time. Um, yeah, that's our policy really. And we have opted for calcium lime rather than mag lime recently. Um, but yeah, that's a point for discussion, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think the, the the mag mag here is is relatively low. It's obviously pretty good at at site five, but otherwise. Um, relatively low on the site. Uh, a magnesium limestone isn't all magnesium. It contains a fair amount of calcium too. So because of that, a mag lime is actually not a bad option on this these soils, which are low in both magnesium and calcium. Obviously, if you had soils that were naturally high in magnesium, such as those in across the hills in County Durham, over the mag limestone or close to it, um, that's the kind of situation where using the mag limestone doesn't make sense. But here where both calcium and magnesium are, are relatively low, keeping an eye on it carefully, obviously through analysis, 
Magline isn't a bad option for you, I don't think. It's obviously not essential every time, but it's going to be useful in on that rotational basis. And especially if you're doing a good job, and it, as you say, it absolutely does look like you are at keeping your pH about right. So a small amount of lime, you know, is only going to give you a small amount of mag to just keep it where you want it to be. Liz, I'm just, going to, I'm just going to pause you there. Um, we've had a question come in asking what the abbreviation you're using across the top for PMN stands for. And I know we've not got I'll get there in a little while. I was going to say, I'm sure you will explain it, but um, if you can just make sure we, we get to that, that would be a great amazing. Yeah. yeah, we will do. We're going to keep going. So the same scorecard, so the scorecard's not going to change, but we're going to move through the indicators we're looking at. So here now, the P and the K, and often P and K in soils are show, are show us a manuring history. Um, remember here, we're not using these to you to guide our fertilizer planning, but to keep an eye on our strategy in the same way as, as we might use the soil health um, pHs to keep an eye on whether our liming strategy is appropriate. So in the same way, we might actually do our soil health assessments almost at the opposite end of the rotation when we do than we do P's and K's just to see where where those sit. And actually, we we often see that we've got high P and K in soils around yards where muck has been, and I use the term advisedly, dumped over, over centuries. And so often quite close to either farm yards or uh, rick yards, uh, sorry, um, stock yards out in, in field areas, we find quite high levels of um, P and K. And the standout field here is obviously field five with showing amber now for phosphorus it's phosphorus is one of those nutrients where as the, the level gets very high in the soil it starts to flag amber whereas with um, potassium there's no environmental risk associated with potassium so actually this this number could get infinitely high um, and the uh, it wouldn't go uh, away from green but as phosphorus comes into index four and above we start to flag up that there's a potential risk if the soil were to leave the field. So it's there as a marker, a reminder of the importance, therefore, in those systems of keeping an eye on minimising soil loss directly from fields um, through runoff. Um, we can see short-term impacts um, on potassium K. So that's one of the reasons that we've actually got a high number in field five because slurry had been applied in late summer. But equally, we can see short term impacts that give us those smaller numbers. So high removals in grass, particularly actually in silage, can give us um, reductions in K. Grass is very good, especially when cut as silage at luxury uptake at taking up more K than it needs and when the grass is cut as silage that's removed from the field so K becomes potentially limiting more quickly in those grassland situations. So what struck you Henry about the, the P and K particularly here um, if anything? Well when I first saw it the, the K at, at site six the grass field that being so low struck me i mean it makes once you think about it it doesn't make sense you know we've we've thought we were doing the right thing taking slurry further away from the dairy where it traditionally hasn't always gone and we haven't actually slurried that field since march um, and we've taken three cuts of silage off it so it probably does um, stand to reason it's a bit low so it sort of makes you rethink that and we should probably be putting a bit more slurry on um, around those fields as well um and yeah, site five being so high in, in P and K as well. Um, it is um, right next to a, a concrete pad, um, which has traditionally had muck tipped on it because it was quite a handy pad. Um, so yeah, it, it's had quite a lot of muck, more than its fair share probably in the, in the last 10, 15 years. So um, yeah, it's probably reflective of that and, and the slurry that we put on in, um, in September. Yeah, I think I think your sites three and four are are those kind of sites that you were thinking to target, weren't they, with your um, move of slurry out from the farmyard? Uh, one and two, actually quite close to to the eight bank site, um, have probably had slightly more 
um, slurry recently over recent years than and then those sites the other side of the railway. So th yeah, I think those yeah. two if that, that yeah. The interesting thing about the P that was sort of thought as well, you know, that shows that they're broadly pretty good. Um and yeah, you know, we probably don't need to be putting P on maybe. Um but if, if you look at that for well, what's in the soil, but we do definitely see a response from seedbed phosphate fertilizer. Um, so, it, you know, is there something wrong with the availability of the phosphate in the soil? Is there something we could do to improve that to avoid us needing to put, put phosphate into the seedbed? I think a small amount of, of targeted seed phosphate is, is is often does show a response because those seedlings as they grow phosphorus is really slow to move in soils so actually the the plant roots as they reach out will find the the seed applied the slot applied phosphorus first and then we'll be able to respond to that much more effectively than this more diffuse amount of phosphorus in the soil around that phosphorus becomes really quite important then to support phosphorus uptake in the later growth phase of plants. So I think particularly um, where uh, you're trying to support quick establishment or support robust establishment, seedbed phosphorus and perhaps for some crops um, using DAP, such as on um, rape, can really support um, a rapid establishment because of that combination of both nitrogen and phosphorus targeted together. So we've done physical, all pretty good. We've had a quick look at chemistry. Let's have a look at those biological indicators. So we're coming to this end where these indicators are much less well used or understood. And, and I've talked a little bit about organic matter here measured by loss on ignition. I'm gonna mention those two others, PMN and CO2 burst. These are both indicators of biological activity. Within the project, we've, we've been trying them both. Um, they show similar patterns to each other, um, but they measure those things in slightly different ways. So PMN is a the initial stand for potentially mineralizable nitrogen. It's an assay that's done on fresh soil that looks at how much nitrogen is released in a controlled incubation in the laboratory. The CO2 burst does something similar but works with dried soils which are then re-wetted and we look and see how much CO2 is produced in that burst of activity that, respond, that, that results. Both have been shown over a number of years to be good indicators of things like microbial biomass, the sort of size and, act and potential activity of the population in soil. They're not measuring what's actually happening in the soil at the time, both are potential measures. So they're there as activity indicators. I think though, what we should st always start with in our biological measures is the organic matter. Um, and in this context, I think it's really interesting to notice that the organic matter at this site, these sites is relatively low. And perhaps we are going to be a little bit surprised to see that the dairy pasture is no better than um, field 13 in the arable rotation. Both sites um, have a regular cultivation policy and that's because of the reseed policy associated with those, those dairy pastures and so actually it's possible in the arable system here field 13 doing it better than uh, field one to maintain um, good organic matter levels again field be that site five field 71 72 on the medium side stands out and that's probably too due to that long mucking history at that site making it stand out really quite distinctly from those slightly heavier soils um sorry slightly lighter soils and that's the um at site three and four i think it's important that on those medium soils to just note that the organic matter does track the clay content differences. So site three has the lowest clay content at 20%, site four, 25, and site five, 34% um, clay. But the long-term mucking history at site five is, is then giving us that, that added uplift. Um, the lighter soils are actually doing quite a good job and a pasture or in field 13 at maintaining good levels of organic matter but these aren't 
perfect levels of organic matter. They are green, but it's possible to achieve higher levels to go above that just making the average for the for the site and the year and actually a number of these soils are below average than we would expect in this region um, and on these light or medium soils we can also just have a quick look at those microbial um, indicators um, you can just have a look at site six and it's quite clear there that even though we've got the same organic matter in sites two and six, we've got much higher microbial activity in both measures, CO2 and PMM, um, in the grassland. And that's because the grassland is photosynthesizing and hence giving more food throughout the year. And so that's able to keep a larger population of soil organisms fed and happy. On the arable soils, the microbial activity dominantly tracks the organic matter with lower numbers where the organic matter is lower. It's not exactly true and actually we've got that stimulation of the CO2 burst on uh, site one perhaps because of the most recent cultivation breaking open some of the um, aggregates and making the organic matter more available. But but let me shut up and let, let Henry comment on, on what he noticed about those biological indicators. You've noticed I've not talked about earthworms, we'll come back to those. Um, yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Um, Louise, the organic matter, yeah, um, one or two, the, the point about the, the dairy pasture being very similar to um, field 13, uh, site two, um, that, that did surprise me, um, particularly because the, the grass field been sown for five years so you know it hasn't been been cultivated in that that time um and you know i'm sort, sort of trialing to to get more grassland throughout the rotation um into into arable fields to increase organic matter um and look at that perhaps it's not the right thing perhaps we should be looking down the more or herbal layer route that's more Rather than going for a grass that's going to be silage three times a year to benefit the dairy, perhaps we should be looking at um, more herbal layer sort of to, to in, improve, improve soil organic matter more if, if grassland is making that massive difference. Um, I don't know what your thoughts on that would be. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think we kind of almost have an assumption that the grassland will be better but a, a intensive dairy pasture or especially one that's also you know cut for silage is probably doing quite a lot of the same things that a, a, an arable field is doing it's only when we reduce the intensity and that will happen on, in the dairy in some other dairy pastures too um you know where dry cows or young stock are raised we we've got different sorts of pastures at different sorts of intensity so it may just be that you know this is one that that is functioning at that almost arable like intensity or it might of course be something that's special about site two so uh, field 13 henry so it might be that actually it's something to do with a long-term history at field 13 perhaps that a bit like um field 71 72 has had a reasonable amount of of rough muck um over the the years yeah, well, and so that's why we've yeah. got higher yeah no you're right it, it, it has had more more muck than than some of the others yeah and so we, we need to be you know obviously a little bit careful but that helps us though well okay if we are mucking regularly the arable fields actually we can do as good a job as having them in grass but actually we probably don't have enough muck to go around to do that so actually the the balance as you suggest you know it, it's not just what plants are in the lay but also then how that lay is grazed or managed that will be important um, in terms of the amount of organic materials that we're building back up so in terms of organic matter, I mean, you, you never guessed we, we thought we were going to talk about organic matter, Mitt, that building organic matter in soils is very much a balancing act. It's, it's a very simple balance, a bit like my bank balance, where the more I pay in, the chances are the more I'll accumulate. So actually, there is a very simple relationship um, between organic materials going in and soil organic matter, but not all soil 
uh, materials added turn into soil organic matter. We need to also take account of the fact that it's the carbon in those organic materials that's really important for building organic matter. And so it's not just the amount of organic material, tons of muck, but we need to take account of the water content and the, the, the um, amount of carbon actually contained. And of course, those things will also decompose and release some of that carbon back to the atmosphere. So it's also important how well stabilised in the soil the organic material as it breaks down becomes. And that stabilisation is increased with the clay content of the soil. And we saw that with that change across the arable soils with the organic matter contents pretty much tracking the clay content of the soil or it's showing the same relationship that as clay contents were increasing so were organic matters and that's because of the increased stabilization that clay gives a larger surface area and ability to to lock up that organic matter in soils and we've talked already um and i've learned the term rough muck on uh, on this farm um the, about the different sorts of organic matter but just to give you that that simple graph that shows this is work that was done over a number of long-term sites has been published by uh, colleagues at ADAS showing that just simply as we increase the tons per hectare of carbon we add to the soil the change in the carbon stock increases so at if we're adding relatively small amounts of carbon we'll see either a decline or no increase in car in organic matter and that would be the case in an arable rotation where uh, residues were being taken away and only roots and stubbles perhaps were going back in. As we go along to the right on the graph, we're seeing increasing organic matter additions in, in a whole range of materials in, across these um, studies. But it's a relatively simple relationship, but not a perfect one. So we can see here that there is a, quite a lot of wobble on this graph so that um, some amendments tend to increase organic matter slightly more than others. And that's um, one of the things that we brought together in the um, recent, it's not that recent now, probably nearly two years ago, leaflet on organic matter for AHDB, um, ADAS and ourselves working together with also with the data coming from Rothamsted to look at how different types of organic materials might actually work in the system. So the benefit then of things like slurries and digestates in the system is largely to supply those quantities of P and particularly K and other nutrients into the system. As liquids, they contain relatively little bulky carbon. So actually they have only a small improvement in terms of soil biology or soil structure. It's also um, that we see that with more solid materials we've got a split between those that are more active and likely to release more nutrients and those that are stable um, where actually their main impact is in soil conditioning that, that table's there for you um, in the in one of the handouts in the soil organic matter leaflet but it, it it's one of those things I think that's really important to, to think through when we're thinking about using organic materials from dairies and from other livestock systems and how they're deployed and used on the farm, targeting both nutrients and um, soil stabilising. I'm just going to just go back that slide and just say to Henry, does that sort of fit with what you're seeing in terms of how you or how you're thinking about using your muck and slurries on the farm? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, we're trying to, to get the, the P and K in through, through the slurry. Um, we've got, got lots of slurry, too much at this time of year. Um, but yeah, and we, we we don't really have enough muck, or we'd, we'd always like more muck. Um, um and yeah it, it pretty much fits with what we're doing um but if we could tip the farmyard manure slurry balance in the favor of farmyard manure um that would that would help us but uh, we can't really do a lot about that no i guess one of the things that some dairies are doing is looking at um at separating slurry a bit isn't it so that they can and have those liquids in a in a form that they can use in a more targeted way but that they're producing more solids but that's quite a big capital investment to move to changing that sort of management of slurry so let's go to earthworms the one thing we haven't talked about but 
important that what we've got there is a count of earthworms and we need to recognize that what we've actually got in the soil are different sorts of earthworms so we've got three main groups but actually this diagram suggests shows us that there are there's one group there's a group that that play in the middle too so the earthworms that we are kind of grow up with thinking about as earthworms the ones that come to the surface and cast and create their middens just two species in the uk that do that those earthworms can become um in in some circumstances um the length of small snakes but sort of um 30 centimeters or so is not necessarily uncommon but they can also be quite short the thing that distinguishes them is their thickness so we can have um they're, they're the sort of thickness of ball, a ballpoint pen those anisic or deep burrowing earthworms and they basically um make those deep vertical burrows some um side movement but only to to gallery and to create spaces for themselves to deposit their cocoon or to shelter they they wrap themselves up and shelter from harsh conditions such as uh, drought or um, they, they try and move into those galleries or to the surface when something like a, a salty fertilizer or a slurry is applied. Then we've got a whole set of earthworms that live within the soil. We can see that network of galleries running dominantly sideways and those endogenic earthworms are soil feeders and create a network and mixing of the topsoil and those earthworms dominantly respond to fresh organic matter additions. They're not so disturbed, though they are disturbed, by cultivations um, as the deep burrowers. The deep burrowers get really grumpy when their um, permanent uh, burrows, their vertical burrows are disrupted. And it's, it's those earthworms that we see changing most rapidly where a system moves from a, a plough based system towards uh, a zero till system. And we see those middens and casts at the surface. The earthworms that live within the soil, we don't see so often, but actually those endogenic earthworms are the most populous. There are the most of them. And then soils that are stable and at particular times of the year, for example, um, just after harvest, when there's a lot of surface litter, we'll also see um, these epigenic or epiendos, the ones that live just in the soil, the litter dwellers and those are the earthworms that if we were we were bringing in compost worms those are the um the earthworms that, that live in compost heaps so what about you though some of you will have noticed the numbers about earthworms um as we went through already and that's one a bit like the organic matter one of those areas where it looks like these numbers are quite low uh, just to show that we really did find earthworms though these and these are from the arable an arable field these aren't the grassland earthworms so we've got the very long here deep burrowing earthworm with its paddle tail and some of the other um smaller and uh, en endogenic earthworms that we saw too and a couple of the epigenic surface um litter dwellers there so there are lots of interacting factors that drive our earthworm numbers and so it can be really difficult to assume or interpret anything just from earthworm numbers. It's why it's important to always take them into context. So we have higher numbers here in our spade full of soil in the grassland. But you'll notice that the grassland, it's not quite the highest of the ones we measured, but it, if the light soils, it's by far and away the highest, but it's coloured in amber. And that's because although um, we allow the green flag to show green at eight earthworms in a spade full of soil for arable soils actually the number is much higher in grasslands so we have a separate indicator color for grassland and actually the grassland indicator also asks for there to be more diversity of earthworms too in general we tend to see fewer earthworms in lighter soils um, but this isn't currently shown up in the indicator colours. So actually, seven earthworms in a block of soil on a light soil, such as that in field 18, uh, 13, is a really good number for uh, a very light soil. Um, recently cultivated soils will always tend to have fewer. They've been disturbed and disrupted. So sites one, three and four here had had relatively recent cultivations. And the numbers of earthworms also respond to the additions of, well, earthworm food. So manures 
and growing plants so particularly here site six and five showing those um, additions and site five as a site so a site uh, it was mentioned earlier that had had slurry applied um, in the late summer but actually hadn't been cultivated so um, it had been due to be cultivated for wheat, but hadn't been. And so actually we found, found in this particular set of sample the highest number of earthworms there. We also, by eye, might say, well, earthworms also sort of track organic matter. But it's really tricky to unpick perhaps some of these interactions some of the time. And I know, Henry, you were, we dug both site one, where we hardly found any earthworms, and site five, where we found the most together. So you got a sense of actually the difference between your soils in terms of earthworms. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was really quite refreshing to see site five, um, see how many there the was and, and the range of them as well. Um, you know, there, there were yeah, all, all different um, species like you like you mentioned, and um, yeah, it was good good to see them. Um, and I'd never really. I always, my ignorance, I just thought an earthworm's an earthworm. You know, I didn't realise they were so so complicated. Um, and it, it's something that I could do much more often, just get a spade and have a dig in and at different times um, in the cropping cycles and, and see what's going on with them really. And um, yeah, no, it was, it was it was really good to see it really. Yeah, we, we haven't really talked about the, the structure score that you obviously would do at the same time as you were doing the earthworms. It isn't just about the score. It's also just a, it's, it's really getting an eye for how the soil looks. Um, how did you I've shown the photos a, a while ago and I didn't let you interrupt when I showed those. How did you find the looking at the soil? Yeah, like you said, the, the pictures are, are really valuable um, for a snapshot. Um, yeah, no, it was it was it was really really interesting to see and it was we're pleasantly surprised really um with, with how how it was um particularly site five i thought that would have been um a lot lot poorer structure than, than it was um it had quite a hard winter um yeah and it, it's it's actually you did you made it so easy to do that it it is something that there's no excuse not to just walk around a field with a spade when you're going and and do some of these digging. Um, yeah, and I think if you can find the right place to do it regularly in the rotation, so you know you maybe always do it after, and it, it can be what after whatever that just comes round regularly and becomes then a useful check. Because part of the problem, if we look at looking at our earthworms here, is having sites with different cultivations recently or different mucks recently it means it's difficult. To, to compare between them apart from just to say oh look they're all different to each other but finding that regular place in the rotation where you look at the physical and the chemical by sending a sample away together can be really useful so that's me and henry though i'm sure you Michelle stacking up some questions for us. Um, we've got um, a number of um, resources attached to the webinar today. Um, I'm flagging up two particularly here, one for grassland and one for um, arable systems. The principles of soil management is relatively new. Um, it was it's been developed particularly as part of the project that I'm involved in to give some of those underpinning principles um, in the context of grassland. The better returns guide was was updated relatively recently too, um, and to pick up and use this information. So the two, um, whether you're a grassland or an arable farm, will now work really well as a, as a pair of, of um, documents. And the idea of the principles guide is that it then doesn't replace but leads you on to look at some of those other guides that are also available things like that measuring and managing organic matter or the establishment guide and other things too but thank you for listening to us um, and we'll be waiting to antis eager anticipation to um, share your questions brilliant that's been a great overview and we have got uh, quite a few questions but happily i can group a few of them together so the first one is, um, well, the first group. So is there a reason you lose, use loss of ignition over the DUMAS test? Um, is there a calculation to convert them? And can you then relate the loss of ignition to organic matter 
or to organic carbon? So yes, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> apart from the first one should have been. Uh, so why did we lose loss on ignition and why do we why have we used that as our benchmark we had a we had a big meeting actually of all sorts of soil scientists in a room arguing stroke having informed conversations and arm wrestling about actually which measures we wouldn't wouldn't use um we felt after that arm wrestling that benchmarking on organic matter rather than organic carbon was as good and actually chimed with things that had gone in the past. It doesn't really matter. It is possible to relatively easily convert between them. There are some soils in which that's more tricky, just as there are some soils in which all of these tests for organic carbon are tricky. Now, they're not soils that Henry owns, but they're soils, particularly soils with high um, chalk or limestone levels where the inorganic carbon in the soil can make measuring total carbon well a bit complicated because now we've got inorganic and organic carbon and we have to pick them apart for the numbers I ref i'm just going to say look at the hand the handout there on soil organic matter we specifically in that handout gave those conversions so that people who were having carbon done could convert fairly easily Equally, um, people who want to know how much carbon when they've got an organic matter number can also convert fairly easily. Um, there's there's a little bit of wobble on those numbers, but not a lot. They're fairly robust. Brilliant. And then the only last bit, and I'm sure I think I know the answer to this, um, but um, should you believe one set of results over another if you're comparing do mass and loss of ignition? Well, the answer to all soil science questions is, of course, it depends. Um, you will get slightly different answers. So it, it really does depend there. If I've taken the same bag of soil and split it and sent it off for the two tests, then actually they should give me the same relationship. I'd be really surprised if they didn't, unless I was in one of those really complicated soils where I need to do the unpicking. I would choose one method and stick with it. Your your preferred lab will do what usually do one or the other it doesn't matter hugely for on farm decision making about organic matter which one you use if you were to be thinking about moving towards some sort of carbon offsetting scheme for british airways or dyson or anybody else who might want some carbon offsetting then the way carbon is measured will become much more important but that's not just about the test but also about how many samples are taken and a lot more things so for basic farm is my organic matter about where i expect it to be it doesn't matter which of those tests you use but be consistent um, and, and use them robustly with good sampling Brilliant. And you touched on the colouring um, and the traffic light system, um, but we've had a question come in that's what's the basis for deciding what's good, bad or in between? And does it change depending on the soil? And also linked to that is a question about whether people can get hold of where those benchmarks essentially are. Yeah, so the, the initial benchmarking report, um, which was the result of lots of soil scientists arm wrestling, and to choose the indicators and then decide on what we were happy with as the benchmarks um, was project two of the soil biology and soil health program so that report was published in 2018 and is available through the remainder of the soil biology and soil health project we're testing those on farm i commented i think in relation to earthworms that currently um, those traffic lights don't take account of soil type I think one of the things we're half thinking from the data we're getting is that we will do something to adjust those benchmarks for the lighter soils because it, it, it otherwise lighter soils always look like they're really bad for earthworms and, and actually a light soil with a low number is doing pretty well so we think we're going to adjust that one um, we've also been looking very carefully as part of the project and a very recent release I think only last week um, is the new benchmarks for the CO2 burst test in the UK that um, NRM worked with us to develop but are available 
and benchmarks for PMN. So all of those benchmarks are being made available and publicly available uh, so that they can be used um, as part of anybody's interpretation. Um, but we will be releasing a new set or the tidied up final set, I guess, um, at the end of the project in about a year's time. Brilliant. I'm going to give AHD a cheeky plug here and say there's various bits and there's the case studies available on the Great Soils website. Um, so we're going to move on to worms now. Um, so you looked at the worm counts. Um, what's the best time of year to do a worm count and what's the volume of soil you measure the worms in? So the benchmark is set for a standard spade. I actually tend to use a small spade, which means I get to multiply my worms up. So actually the numbers I showed you, Henry, aren't the numbers we counted. They're the numbers in our small spade multiplied up in, into the, the equivalent volume of that larger spade. So a, a standard spade is 20 by 20 by a depth of 25 or thereabouts. Actually, worms tend to associate with roots and topsoil. So the depth isn't quite so important as just making sure you've got a spadeful of soil to have a proper look at. The reason we've gone with that spadeful approach is it works really easily on farm. We don't have any silly measuring or anything going on. We've got a nice way of, of doing that. And it also links to that visual assessment of soil method at the same time. So you kind of get bang for your buck. You get to do both measures in, in one go, which makes it really easy. Um, I've probably missed something. Remind me what I've missed. Best time of year. Oh, best time of year. It needs to be warm. Well, not warm, but not cold and moist. So therefore, the ideal time for worms and the maximum worm and biological activity in soil is either a spring or an autumn thing. So just when farmers are most busy is the best time for measuring worms. So if the ground's good for cultivating, that'll be also a good time for counting worms. The good thing is that actually even in runs where it's good for cultivating, you get some days when actually it isn't quite fit to, to do cultivating, gr drilling, or any of those other things you'd like to get on with. So actually there is always space to just do one or two sites in a year to do the worm counts and the visual assessment. So we have been benchmarking all of our indicators in this autumn window. It's not to say it's a date, it's a period when the soil has re-wetted in the autumn, and in some autumns that's earlier than others, um, but before the soil gets cold. But that actually gives us quite a long window in the autumn, roughly speaking, the end of September towards the beginning of December. Um, I'm gonna say well, I was on farm on something like the 23rd of October in Penrith, it was thereabouts. Brilliant, and we're gonna stick with worms with just two more questions. Um, so you talked about ploughing, disturbing the, the soils and disturbing the worms and no-till being better, but um, what about min-till and your leg-based cultivations? Is that better than ploughing or still as, as much of a problem for worms? Where do they fit? The, the data ten, tends to suggest it's, it's in between. So it does tend to suggest it's in between. In general, we see increasing worm numbers with decreasing intensity of tillage. Um, so I guess if we needed to find something evil, we go and look at potato crops and sugar beet, where actually there's perhaps been, or, or field vegetables, where there's been some real intensity of tillage in the rotation. And that's not just ploughing, that's destoning and all those other operations too. If I need to find a field which has got very low worm numbers to show to someone, I'll go and find a light potato field that's had lots of cultivations. Actually, we can find high worm numbers, and, and Henry had some, where we'd applied good levels of manure on a good level of organic matter soil where it hadn't been disturbed in the last three months or so. And actually that can allow worm numbers to, to respond really well. So our worm numbers are quite resistant to change, but what we will see changing is those deep burrowing worms, those vertical burrowers, they really don't like being disturbed. So those are the ones we tend to see increasing in numbers quite fast as we move to a conservation tillage system. And that's not just the tillage. A true conservation tillage system's also got higher levels of organic matter inputs at the surface. So usually more stubbles or, or cover crops. And that means there's also more food for the worms. So you get a double, double benefit from those sorts of systems. 
brilliant. Um, we have got lots more questions and what I will do is if it's okay with you two, I'll get them answered um, and we'll release that with the recording of the webinar. Um, we, otherwise, I think we may be here for another hour. Um, I will ask you uh, both one more question to finish. So Henry, based off what you've seen tonight, what is the first thing you're going to go away and do with these results? Um, well, first, first thing, probably think about um, our slurry and muck again. Um, try and put a bit more slurry on on the dairy ground. Try and keep that K consistent throughout the season because um, obviously it's probably probably slightly lacked. Um, and for site one in particular, uh, the organic matter was fairly low and earthworms were the lowest. We try and get some um, rough muck on there um, in the autumn. Um, the real thing is to just go and do it a bit more often, really, and just keep keep digging more, really, and <laughs> keep monitoring it. Brilliant. And uh, Liz will know this because I've done a few meetings with Liz, and I think I always pose her this question. But if there are three things that every farmer could go away from this webinar and think about, what would you say to them? Oh, and you and you told me what I needed to say because you said you'll always say. And actually, Henry, <laughs> Henry's already said actually this is easy to do if you're a farmer have a spade not just one but try and have a spade in every vehicle on the farm make it easy for yourself to when you see something to get out and have a look i wonder why that's not doing that quite right or i wonder why this time of year the other thing to look out for when you're driving around and a reason to get your spade out and have a look is in places where water is sitting that you wouldn't expect it to and have a look and say, is, is there some problem with the structure there? Waiting to look at structure to make a decision about sh what depth I should run my legs on my um, uh, subsoiler in the summer is a bad decision. Now and through to the other end of spring is a good time to be thinking about where am I seeing compaction? Because I can see it because water doesn't move through the soil so well. So look at where water's sitting and follow that up with the spade is my top tip for now. It's starting to get a bit cold and wet for doing the, 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 kind, the bigger kind of assessments. And the other one I think, well, actually, it's getting to the point in the year when actually it's a good time for farmers just to put their feet up for a few minutes. So I think that's probably all right. Brilliant. So all that leads you to do is close and um, I'll just run through a few bits from AHDB in the meantime. Um, so we are still funding research projects relating to the soil health scorecard um, and um, soil biology and soil health and those can be found on our website and we've just published the 2020-2021 um, arable research review and I thoroughly recommend having a look at that because that details all of the research projects that your levy is currently funding. Um, and it includes the work on soil health. There are loads of great publications available on the Great Soils website. I have attached a few as handouts to this webinar, along with some bits out of RB209. Um, they are all available in hard copy as well. So if you'd like to be sent hard copies of, web of publications, just um, drop us an email um, and you can download them from this webinar. There are uh, there is a team that specialises in the environment and soil um, at AHDB, and they are all available to contact if you ever had any questions. We have got work going on at both of the strategic farms. The strategic farm East is concentrated um, looking at cover crops and their effect um, in preventing leaching across the rotation. And strategic farm West is looking at the effect of depth of cultivations. Um, both of them quite interesting trials and um, were talked about during our strategic farm week a couple of weeks ago and those are all available on our, on our website. Um, this is a nice layout. We've heard from the Penrith Monos Farm Henry tonight um, but there are Monos Farms spread across the country um, and if you wanted to get involved with that programme hopefully we'll be going back to meetings in the not too distant future. Um, and you can find out where your local mollusk farm is. On that note, we are currently recruiting for a new strategic cereal farm, um, either in the north or the south. So if you happen to be in one of the counties highlighted um, and you'd like to get involved at putting the research into practice, 
on a farm scale, um, get in touch. There is a recruitment site open, but if you want to just email, please feel free. Um, this is our last Monitor Farm Monday webinar before Christmas, um, but they restart again on the 11th of January, um, starting to think about Elms. Um, and you can get involved with any of those free to attend webinars. Uh, this is your Arable Knowledge Exchange team. Um, they, we're here for you guys. Um, if you have any queries or want any more information about um, various things, um, we'll all happily get back to you um, either over the phone or via email. So that leads me to close. Um, thank you for attending. Um, this webinar will close and when you leave, you'll be taken directly to a survey. If you can fill it out, please do. It helps us with planning for the future and understanding how we can make things better. This webinar has been recorded and the recording will be available on YouTube in the next couple of days if you want to watch it back. Basis and Neuroso points will be available. Hopefully, if you haven't already, um, you can send in your details in the chat. But if you miss out, you can always just pop them on an email to me and I'll sort those out. If you do have any follow up questions, I have said we'll try and publish all the, of the remaining questions alongside the video. But you can get in contact with either me, Henry or Elizabeth using the details as shown. All that leaves me to say is a great big thank you to um, Elizabeth and Henry for being involved tonight. It's been great to hear about what's been going on at Penrith and how other farmers can get involved and utilise um, the Soil Health Scorecard. Uh, thank you for the audience you're attending and hope you might not realise, but Christian has been in the background keeping us on track the whole way through. Um, so um, thank you to him as well. And from all of us at AHDB, I just want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we hope to see you again in the future. <laughs>